so my talk is a little bit off of the topic of uh, thermo quantum thermodynamics. So, but it's still related. So I'm more interested to understand uh, how closed uh, many body closed quantum systems can equilibrate. Okay, and what is the equilibration time that it takes for that to happen? So my motivations, in principle, as I was saying, is the foundation of quantum statistical mechanics. And one idea is how to derive statistical mechanics from uh, quantum microscope dis descriptions. So this is a very, very old problem. You know, since the, uh, the beginning of uh, statistical mechanics, this Boltzmann's uh, idea. Also, how, is ready to how equilibration and thermalization happens, and how to relate uh, to the transition between quantum and classical mechanics. No? And of course, another motivation is that it's already more than 10 years that we are able to study these things and just show example. We can go to the lab and uh, monitor systems that are almost closed. So you can see unitary dynamics and see what happens there. And of course, from the practical point of view also, it's to understand why my beer gets so fast, no, here in Natal or in Rio. So I'm gonna start with some review of some results of the last 10 years which is a kind of a new way to understand the foundation of statistical mechanics using quantum mechanics. Uh, and at the end, I'll try to show some results we have about the bound for this fine time, which is the time. So the idea is like, I have this very complex system, which uh, I'm trying to say like I have a phase space if it was in a classical case, just to illustrate. So I can't really monitor the all degrees of freedom of my uh, system, but I have some macroscopic information. Oh, this is the standard textbook. So like I know the energy of the system. So this is the possibility of the microstates I could have. So I know that my system is one of these microstates, which in quantum case would be a pure state, but I'm not sure which one of them it is. So what I usually do is that I define average state, okay, ensemble of states, and I work with these guys. And usually so I find this average state. In a microcanonical case, for example, I have the identity here. So I somehow I give up to have a complete description of my seat. I put by hand some probabilities there. That's what I usually do. So the idea is I would like to not to do this because I you know, believe that the system, even though I'm describing it as an ensemble, it's in a finite state. Okay? And the idea is why when I describe it for an ensemble, I get the right results. So let's imagine it, it is in a, fine, in a given uh, well-defined pure state. Okay? And I wanted to measure some observable, okay? It can be the temperature, whatever. And then what I usually do is that I use my average state to define the value of this observable, the ensemble, okay? And this is actually equivalent to get many states at random and make the average. It's equivalent to get the average state already. So what if I don't use the average? I just use some given state, which is the error I'm committing. Oh, what's the difference? I use the statistical mechanics, no? And to quantify how much error I get, so this is a already old result, no, short is here, and what I can, if I, every time I pick a state, I see the error and do this many times and I make this average, I have like a variance here, I can give this upper bound that this guy is bounded by the purity of the, which is usually quite small, it goes exponentially with the Hilbert space, it will double exponentially with the my system. So this decay very, very fast. So this shows if I pick some state at Rundle, most of the time the error I'll be making is very, very small. So we say that typically, you no, know, the average, the value of the observable is close to the average one. So this is actually somehow is also in the standard book of statistical mechanics. This is nothing more than the we prove there that, that when you use the canonical ensemble, when ensemble, you prove that the fluctuations are small, okay? So this is, what you're doing here is that you're putting these in a more formal setting, it's more rigorous, and also you're doing the full analysis in quantum mechanics, and you don't actually have to say anything about the Hamiltonian, anything, it's very, very general. Which is good on one side, but it's also bad, as I will say. So this is what the was principle of apparent equal a prior probability. So it says that you don't have to use the ensemble. It's just an easy way to make the calculations if you want, but it doesn't matter. You could just right. okay. So this is a way to justify why you know they work. 
ties also. Somehow you can see that the entanglement is responsible because if I pick an steady state that is separate, depending on the observable, you say that these are the states where this you're going to make big errors here. So this uh, one idea is that here I don't put a probability set for free. Why I'm using get the same result when I use an ensemble, which I have to put probability by hand. I get the same result because of the entanglement. A uh, way to see this, a picture, no, okay, I should also say that this result which came out in 2006 it was in a paper by von Neumann in 1959. This paper was somehow forgotten for a while, but if you go in archive now, there would be a paper by von Neumann there, something. And it was uh, Lebowitz and the group, they discovered this paper, which was uh, still in, in German. They can put it in archive. Okay. okay, from the beginning of the 2000s also, where they also mentioned these things. And the picture is how it is. Now I have all my Hubert space, if you want, the restricted one, and I what I'm putting blue is that most of the states which live here, which is come or the exponential large size of the Hubert space of the possible microstates, when I look at this observer, they look like class thermostates. There is some just exponentially small region here, which is the out of equilibrium states, that they look like uh, uh, not thermal. Okay, you have to have something here, no? And of course, so this is a, 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 um, the picture that you can have to justify why the Thermalization is general, if you want, and why it happens. And of course, here there is no dynamics. So the next step, okay, I proved that if I pick up these guys at random, then most of the states, they look like thermal. But the question is, I have some definite state here, out of equilibrium. I start my dynamics, and they just go to evolving. You know. So can I prove that for most of the dynamics, these guys will stay most of the time around this equilibrium region? So in the fact that you can also do this, so using most of the same uh, techniques. There was this paper also again by the group of Shorty, Popescu, and also by Ryman independently. And if you say that you get any Hamiltonian, I just by created the spectrum, and I get any initial state, this is quite general, okay? And I look now, I get some observable, and now I'm not picking state at random, I'm just looking at the time evolution. You know? My time evolution is in the Hilbert space, and I see that this observer will fluctuate in general, okay? And then I define, uh, actually I'm seeing how much it's fluctuating. For this first I have to make one hypothesis, which is that there is no generate gaps, okay? So any two level system, I pick the difference, they are never equal, okay? Then it should not be exponential number, so you can also relax this, but you cannot have a lot of them. So you can define an average state with B, if you have an uh, infinite time state, there would be there's one. With state deface it, you get your initial state to just raise all the coherence you have in the energy basis. So this would be most of the time your state look like thermal, okay? When this is not gonna work, if I get an history state with the superposition, just a few eigenstates, like just two, the extreme case would be two, actually you can go to three actually. So if this guy is just two eigenstates to simplify, you see that your state you just start oscillating, like Rabi oscillations forever. These states with the one would not never equilibrate. But it happens that if you have a macro state, these levels, they are just really, really exponentially small. So it's one way to see it's almost impossible in the lab that you're gonna be able to prepare a state which is a superposition, just a few eigenstates. This is really, really impossible, I'd say, to do in the lab for a really macroscopic system. So usually this guy will be a superposition of a lot of states and this proof will be quite small. And this shows that that's what the reason why uh, macro uh, 
systems, macro systems just have to equilibrate somehow. Okay. So this is, as I said, all the results. So it says that the equilibration helps our system with no general gaps. It says that in usually, so the, si the Hamiltonian cannot have the general gaps. And you can, mathematically, you can show that most of the states, if you pick them at random, they have this purity, which is quite small. And as I said, in the lab, that's what I expect to have. What's the problem with these results? So that's uh, they are really nice mathematically because they are quite general, but they don't give you information to you about two things actually. They don't say which is the property of the Hamiltonians that are important. They say, oh, most of the Hamiltonians, they equilibrate. But of course, there are some that don't equilibrate and you don't know which is important. You know, I mean, there is a lot of commutes saying chaos is important if it's integral, it doesn't equilibrate. Of course, I also not talking about thermalization, I'm just talking about equilibration, but there is other ways to see when you expect something to calibrate and not. And here, you don't have this information. What's the physical uh, uh, properties of the Hamilton to that happen? Another thing is that you don't have information about time scale. Okay? It's saying that this guy is going to calibrate at some point, but it doesn't say when. You know? So if this says that you take the age of the universe, this is not much useful. And actually, this was of the critics that I think, not one of these, but at this thing that it's showing you, you know, some people missing the uh, understood the result of von Neumann at that time, saying that he was showing that everything was equilibrating, and this is cannot be. You know? So he's saying that it's, it's a mathematical value result, but with no physical implications. That's why it's one of the reasons the paper was forgotten for some time. So these dynamics descriptions is also already in von Neumann. No? <laughs> so he was already doing these things. So just to show also, I think there is this nice result showing that if you look at the whole state, it's also poor state. So you're really keeping your dynamics unitary. Okay, this is six uh, particles. And if you look at the purity of uh, single sites, it's decaying fast. So it's showing that you have this local equilibration. Also, I should just emphasize, no, I mean, again, the whole system in the poor state. Why it, show it looks like equilibrate? Because you're not able to measure, to monitor the whole system. You're just measuring a few observables. Okay, or just measure locally. So that's what happened. So the question is, so what happens for finite time? So there is also, there are a few results now. I, I actually, I should put more reference here right now, but I mean, the presentation is a bit old. So in 2012, there is an article also by the group of Short, and when they show that you could generalize that bound for a finite time, now I don't take my uh, average over time in the infinite limit. I do it for a finite time. And I can get this bound, which this is the original bound here. In and now I have a correction here due to the fact that I'm doing a finite time. And then you see there, there is this epsilon here, which you can see, the, which is the minimal gap, this difference between the gaps. So you have all these gaps. So now you get the difference between them. Okay, it's next level. It's not the difference between energies, it's between the gaps of the energies. Okay? And you see that what you have is for the equilibration time, this should be of order one. So this time of equilibration should be bigger than log of 2D by this epsilon. What's happened here is that, again, for macroscope systems, we expect the energy levels to go really, really small. And again, the gaps, this epsilon is gonna explode exponentially. So with this bound, usually in general, okay, again, the bound is pretty general, so, uh, the equilibration time you get this is uh, not a good one. So it's going exponential with the system size, okay? So, so this is what's our interest. Can we get a better bound? So what's really happened here? So let's look again what I'm looking you know, at the fluctuations of some observable around its time average. So this is like this sum here. So you have the coefficients of your initial state. That's the information about your initial state. You have the information about the observable you measure and you have the time evolution. Again, this always gonna depend on the observable you choose, the initial state you choose, and who is your Hamiltonian. We always have these three things to play here. So this is all here, okay? The uh, uh, Hamiltonian observable, initial state, and the dynamics. You can just rewrite this, all this as a complex number, which is evolving time. So you can look at this as a sum of complex numbers with phase that vary in time. So you go to this complex plane, you have like many complex numbers, which are initially in some direction, and they're just involved in time. Okay, this is a simple picture. And what you know first, no, usually you have exponential number of these complex numbers here. 
Okay, that's a problem you have always have with the Hilbert space when you increase the exponential with the system size. So I already know it's intuitive also to see that if I pick random numbers at uh, 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 complex numbers randomly, in some way uniformly, and I sum most of them, this is going to be almost zero, okay? Because they're just distributing uniformly around the cycle. So this again, you see why it's hard to pick states out of equilibrium, or why most of the states equilibrate, because you really have to choose all these phases of these complex numbers almost in the same direction, such that this sum is big. You know? This is really naive. You know? This is really simple. But the idea is that even if I go there and really carefully pick all my complex number, my initial state, my observable Hamiltonian, which most of them are, pick, are pointing in the same direction, as time evolves, each one will get a different velocity, each one a different velocity due to the gap, and they just gonna spread around your complex plan, and then it is gonna bec become small. So this is the idea why, how equilibration is happened in the simple way to understand it, okay? And this is just the phase. I mean, this is as old uh, as physics, no? Maybe like a modern physics. It's the same thing that you have in the spread of waves, classical waves, or even a, a wave packet in the Schrodinger equation. The collapse of Rabi oscillation, which is also an old problem. Decay of unstable systems. So if you go to literature, you're going to find the phasing everywhere, okay? Uh, one way to understand why that bound exp exploded exponentially is that at the end, you're trying to make not really it's like you're, in a naive way, again, is ma making each of these terms of the sum quite small, okay? You try to rearrange this sum, but at the end, you are trying to pick some of them and s making them small. But uh, what I'm trying to sell here is that, actually, you have to take, it's a consolation between all the terms that give you equilibration. It's not the fact that some of them are becoming small, okay? So, actually, again, this, it probably, it's everywhere, but I mean, I first saw this in this paper, that one of these, the paper by Mike Trek, this is one of the per first paper on ATH, okay, which is also a very hot subject. And to make a rigorous analysis of this, you should go to some theory of almost periodic functions, which are mathematically really, really, uh, really hard, okay? Or you can go to approximation. So most of these people in the other communities, they make some expansion of your sum. There are many ways to do this, okay? So, but you always have to make assumptions, okay, about what uh, uh, the Hamiltonian, about something. So what I'm gonna present here is just two things. First, I just do some this re uh, risk analysis, okay? It's not rigorous at all. And the idea is that, again, just thinking about this complex number, I know that if the fluctuations become small at the number of this, this is already also come from the bounds, you know, that if the number of particles increase, that's pretty gonna decrease usually and the fluctuations become small. It's important so that most of these terms are different from zero, which are saying, no, the initial state cannot be a superposition of a just a few eigenstates. But here it's also important that most of the gaps are not the same, that most of the observables, the, the terms of the observables are not new, almost new, so I also have this. So you also saw that the phasing time is short in general, and also, you're gonna have recurrences here, okay? If your system is finite, it's always gonna have revivals, recurrency, but they increase very, very fast, okay? If I go, if I can go to the terminal limit, they're gonna go to infinite, so I don't think this is a big problem. And what you can see is that this dephasing time, so we're gonna define this dephasing time or the equilibration time, which is the time for these synchronized complex numbers or these phasers, if you want, just to spread around the cycle, okay? That's the idea. So I want this V alpha, G alpha T to be on the order of two pi, okay? So you see that if all these gaps are the same, this guy will go just evolving everything together. So it's important that this this velocity, they have some distribution, okay, that they're gonna spread. And of course, the distribution of these gaps, they're gonna be important, you know? As they have a bigger and bigger distribution, you the time gonna be smaller. But you also have to uh, take in account these V alphas, okay, because it can happen that most of the guys that are spreading, they're just really, really small here and not the really important complex numbers, okay? So that's the idea that the, the, the the phasing time depends on the, the variance of the distribution of the velocities of your number, okay? But you should also take into account the, the size of each factor. So this is just a picture, so 
you have an initial out of equilibrium state if you want and just spread around this is a very simple picture and the idea is that I'm going to define by hand somehow uh, gap dispersion which as I was saying the, the virus of the gap or dispersion of the gap this is important but I'm also going to define this taking in account the value you know the norm of the my vector okay the v alpha which is the complex the magnitude of the complex number so I define this guy and I'm going to say that when this 2 pi t, no, I'm going to say that delta g t equal of the order 2 pi, I have uh, the phasing time, which is the time that takes to this to spread around. <coughs> so the calibration time is actually depend on this gap dispersion that I define. And this guy comes from uh, three factors. One is the variance of the gap itself. No? So how your velocities are uh, distributed. The other is the variance of the CNs, which is inside here. It doesn't matter that if you have a lot of distribution of the velocity, but you just start with uh, two eigenstates. You're gonna not going to have the phase at all. So it's also to take into account the initial state. And in this V alpha, you also have information about these uh, matrix elements of your observable in the energy basis, the, uh, the off-diagonal terms, which are responsible for the oscillations. So these are the three terms. So the idea is that usually I want that most of my initial states equilibrate. Okay, so the CNs, usually they, the variance of the gaps, because I, I, and the variance of the initial state or the CNs, they're going to increase with the system size. That's what I expect for most of the states. Okay, and so this equilibration times actually would go to zero. Now I have the other problem. The equilibration time would be very, really, really, really small. So what I have to do to keep this finite, okay? So what happens is that this guy should not depend on n. So I'm saying that if I start with some state uh, system and I increase the system size, usually the 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 CN and the VN is they're going to increase. The equilibration time would go to zero. So I need a observable that the off diagonal elements, as I go out of the diagonal, they should not depend on n. So what I'm saying here, no, this is naive, is that the observer which equilibrates, okay, I'm having now some information about which of the observer that would equilibrate in finite time are the ones that the variance, okay, becomes small for large values of the, as I'm going out of the off diagonal of elements, okay? So if I pick a random observable, probably they're going to have a lot of elements out of the diagonal. It would be, you no, know, uh, completely there. But I want observables that are concentrated just around the diagonal. Even I increase the system migrates, but the most of the terms that are relevant are just there. This is also something that appears in ETH. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this is a analysis. Okay, I get this. I could do some kind of Fourier analysis. Again, here it's you should be careful because the f the, the function is almost periodic function, so I cannot really go to to do a Fourier analysis. But uh, you could do something. Okay, the function is not square integral, so if I get the free analysis, uh, free transform of this V alpha is something like this, a V G. And what I can do now is getting some kind of uh, uncertainty uh, this, uh, relation in the Fourier analysis between the, the function and the Fourier. And I could as the variance of delta T, the time that's the case, okay, as I scale for the, the phase in time. And then I use the uncertainty principle to relate this to delta G. Okay, and again, I get that delta t is the order of one over two delta g. Okay, on now this delta g, I didn't define it by hand; it just appeared na naturally here. And again, I get the same thing. Okay, as I said, this is I get the equivalent results, but I have to be careful. So what I should do is that instead of having this delta uh, direct deltas here, I did I should put a Gaussian. So this is a way to do a a bit more for rigorous analysis is still not really rigorous, okay? But I can just change these guys by Gaussians here. And I see if this sum of Gaussians here, they go to a smooth functions, if this could happen, okay? In the case that this will happen, I expect. So, and when my uncertain relation, I'm close to the bound of it, so I also have a distribution that's close to the bound of the uncertain relation, then this thing, uh, this equilibration time that I'm defined should be a good estimate for the uh, equilibration time. Okay. 
So you could do just some simulations. I'm running out of time. So just get some uh, spin chain. You get some initial state with the all magnetization and look at the magnetization. It's see what's late and it goes to zero. You just compare the times that you expect. It's order of 20. It doesn't change much on time on, on size system. This is just mean really small simulations, just maybe a proof of principle. So the conclusion is that equilibration helps for closed quantum systems. That's what we know for a long time. Uh, the conditions here that we should have no general gaps, okay, like free systems, this does not happen. If you have free fermions, I'm going to have a lot of the general gaps. It happens for most of the initial states. And maybe the new information that I'm giving here is that observables, the observables which I would expect to have equilibration, are the ones who have no macroscopic coherence. So these out of diagonal elements which are far away, which give you macroscopic coherence, if we make macroscopic superposition, they should not be there. So, okay. Uh, equilibration time does not diverge on time in this case, and the mechanism is just dephasing. Okay. And it happens, as I say, due to the fact that they are not able to monitor all degrees of freedom of microscope systems. Okay. So I think that's all. I leave questions here. The quantum fluctuations. We are not really taking account quantum fluctuations. There are a few works because I'm looking really at the fluctuations of the observable, the expectation value. There is already some works that look at the real quantum fluctuations, uh, look at other problems, connection with coherence, and the role of entanglement here is also not so clear. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Questions? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I just have a naive uh, question. So like if I think about like a generically non-integrable system where I don't have any funny additional conserved quantities hanging around there, then I can sort of always appeal to kind of hydrodynamics in the long time limit. Then I can define some diffusion equation for an observable. Mm -hmm. And somehow I have a relaxation time, which is one over the diffusion coefficient. So how does this like one over delta G kind of? Yeah. So. So two things. So first here, I'm thinking about, and first I, I would say this is like a local equilibration. So here I'm really just always thinking about a, a translation invariant system. Okay. So this is would be like a local. And also your maybe your picture is like you have a no homogeneous systems. So this would be, I know, I mean, I don't have the completely clear picture right now, but one idea that maybe this is still what is happening locally and then we would still have this diffusion between the systems to have the system completely homo homogeneous. Okay. So, I, but I still don't have a picture clear which is the connection with these two things. Like if I go also, if I, like if I go to this spin system, I go to the fermions uh, picture, then I would also have this spreading of the quasi particles. I would have a, a equilibration, a dephasing time there. How this connect with this is a question I think it's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I don't know right now. But I would like to relate how this because I mean in the ETH, which is of course not a theorem, it's just a hypothesis. Like there is a way of sort of getting a time scale there if you think about at what energy kind of window your system becomes completely random. Mm -hmm. Then the inverse of this is Taulis time, but which is like a relaxation time or inverse of a diffusion coefficient. So I mean, somehow it always seems to me that these sort of arguments with respect to equilibration times, like if you have a generic enough system, you just take the inverse of the diffusion coefficient and you're happy, you know? Yeah. But maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I think, I don't know really the complete answer. I, mean, I think there's like here, just not thinking really in the picture of diffusion. Everything is like homogeneous. I just start with this system with full magnetites. So I think it would be nice to get a system which is not homogeneous and see probably have different time scales. No? You have this local equilibration, then you have the time for this thing to uh, become homogeneous. Because you could also say, what does this relate with the, there is actually a recent paper by Ma Michael Kastner about using the uh, lib robson bounds to make the equilibration time. So this is another time scale when they are, which is the relation between them and all those things. Other questions? No more? Okay, so why don't we thank Thiago again and also all of the speakers of the session. So, Marcelo, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's lunchtime now, correct?